Good morning, church. It is a glorious, cool, sunny day over here in Crossville. I hope that things are similar for you over there. We miss being over there with you, but of course we are um, privileged and content to do what we can to love our neighbors until we can see the top halves of your smiling faces again. We long for that day. Until then, I'm going to sit out here on my front porch with a breeze blowing with birds chirping in the background, my dog playing in the front yard, and let's talk about the Bible song. Uh, what I want to do for the next few days, or the next few weeks rather, you probably leading up to the end of November, is um, talk about, and I need you to hear me here, we're going to talk about the politics of the New Testament. And I understand that there are few terms in the English language in America at this moment more divisive and more explosive than the term politics. Um, but I want to enter into a conversation with Scripture and make room for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives as we consider the possibility that politics in the New Testament will lead us to a very different place than politics in America have led us. And one of the ways that we get at this, and I'm going to lay some groundwork today, I want to, want to kind of put some things on the table that might help us to wrap our heads around this difference for the first few weeks. Um, one of the ways of getting at this is to go back to that old adage, that old truth, that uh, there are three things you don't talk about in polite company. You don't talk about religion, and you don't talk about politics, and you don't talk about money. And really, at the end of the day, we all realize that talking about money is talking about politics, but you don't have to read very far in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, although it's true of the entire New Testament, before you begin to realize that Jesus is talking incessantly about those three things. There are, there are by and far the things that occupy the majority of his time, talking about religion and politics and money. And so there's this obligation that comes with calling ourselves the Church of Christ. An obligation that comes with calling us ourselves a group of people that belong to the Christ, who are Jesus' people, for us to kind of take up the example that Jesus laid down to occupy ourselves with the sorts of things that he occupied himself, himself with, to uh, let his way of doing things shape the way we do things and so we're entering into this conversation at this particular point because the temptation to um, go in ways that Jesus did not go is very strong it's always strong but at times like this not just because it's an election season but because things are so divisive in our nation right now it is a very strong temptation so this is if you will a call um, to hold to those commitments we have to be Jesus people. And so I want to talk for just a minute before laying out some basics and kind of mapping out where we're going to go with this thing. I want to, I want to lay out um, a fundamental way I think the New Testament works in this regard. And to do that, I want to, I want to start with kind of an economic model. Over the years of preaching, I've been doing this for 21 years now, um, one of the things that we commonly run into when talking about money is that uh, people in church will ask a certain set of questions. So we start talking about money and particularly Jesus' attitudes toward the rich and towards the poor and what it means to be rich and what it means to be poor. And, and somebody well-intentioned will say, they will say, are you suggesting that it is wrong for me to own an SUV? That that is somehow sinful? Or somebody with a house with, that has more bedrooms than they have people to put in those bedrooms will inevitably say, are you suggesting that it is wrong for me to own my house that is this big size? And then other questions flow out of those sorts of questions. How much house is too much house? Or how big of a car is too big of a car? At what point does owning a certain kind of car become sinful? At what point does owning a certain size house become sinful? Those are the sorts of questions they ask. And some time ago, it dawned on me that the New Testament is not interested in giving us answers to those sorts of questions. The New Testament, for instance, is not going to draw a line in the sand and say, look, if you own anything bigger than a Ford Explorer, then you're a sinner. You know, Explorer, 
it's cool expedition straight out. It's not going to draw a line in the sand about that. It's not going to put a price figure in our minds and say if you buy a car that is more expensive than this price figure or a uh, number of square feet and say if your house is bigger than this number of square feet then you're a sinner. Um, in other words the New Testament isn't going to lead us to a legalism about economics but rather what it does is it starts to reshape the way we ask questions about our money. It starts to reshape the way we think about our money and in that it forms us into the sort of people who can make wiser decisions about our money. I mean on a base level that uh, legalism doesn't work. It's obvious that one of the reasons my family buys bigger cars is because I have more people to fit into a car and so the uh, morality or the ethics the discussion around such and owning an SUV would be different for my family than it might be for another family. And so the New Testament is going to raise a different sort of questions. Why are you buying this particular car? What role is it going to fulfill in your life? What is your need for this car? What are you trying to communicate with this car? Things like that to which there are good answers and there are bad answers and most of those are answers that you are going to have to to come up with on your own shaped as you are by Christ and the Spirit but it's teaching us to ask a better set of questions and I think that's what the Bible does with politics as well the Bible is going to teach us to look at the situation in a very different way it's going to teach us to ask a different set of questions. It's going to ask us to come at the conversation in a way that is faithful to our obligations to Jesus. And so that's what we're going to be trying to do over the next few weeks. And to get at that, I want to start by just um, laying three fundamental purposes out this morning. I'm going to lay all three out, but we're only going to get to the first one today because I don't want this to go on forever. And we've got some time. There's no need to be in a hurry about this. It's not like we're trying to do this. Um, before election day or anything like that. The reason we're talking about this now is because it's on everybody's mind and everybody's fighting about it. So this is a chance for us to shine with our witness. Um, and so the three principles that I want to start with as we kind of set the scene is uh, number one, Jesus was inescapably political. In the New Testament world, if you read him in his context, he talked about politics all the time. He was a political figure, and you can't escape that. And because of that, by the way, those of us who follow Jesus must also be inescapably political. But we're going to talk more about what that means here in just a minute. Number two, even though Jesus was inescapably political, he was political in ways that was radically different than everybody else was political in his day. Um, I'll just say this now, even though we will get back and talk to them about this more next week. When I say that Jesus was political, but he was radically different than the way everybody else was political in his day, what I want you to hear is this. As we go through this series of talks, if you hear me suggesting that you ought to be a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a member of the Green Party, or a member of the Tea Party, or a Libertarian, you have heard me wrong. The purpose of this conversation is not to convince anybody to be a part of any party, or to abstain from any party necessarily. I'm not going to try to convince you to vote, or to not vote. I'm not going to ask you to write your senator, or even necessarily to know your senator's names. I'm not going to discourage you from writing your senator. What I want to do is suggest that in the Bible, in the life of Jesus and the life of the early church, a new political reality was created that approaches the problems and concerns and cares of the world that God has a heart for in a deeply different way than what we're used to doing in our modern context. And as Christians, we are obligated to taking up that different way. And it's not going to look Republican, and it's not going to look Democrat, and it's not going to look independent, and it's not going to look like voting or necessarily not voting. It's not going to look like writing your senator or not writing your representative. It's not going to look like any of those things at the deepest levels. It's going to be something totally different. And so Jesus was inescapably political. But Jesus was political in ways that were radically different than everybody else in his world. And as such, we are called as followers of Jesus to be inescapably political. 
and political in ways that are radically different from those around us. And third, as we do this, we have to make sure that we are honoring our commitment to actually follow in Jesus' footsteps. That we are honoring the allegiance that we gave to him at our baptism. That we are honoring the allegiance that we gave him um, when we gathered around, even virtually, the communion table this morning. We don't want to fall into the trap of just doing whatever we want to do, of taking up whichever way of doing business that we think best, and then just saying, oh, I did that in Jesus' name. Uh, we are all smart enough, and we've all been in this world long enough and been around the church long enough to know that anybody, anybody can pretty much take up any thing and do it and then say after the fact that they're doing it for Jesus. Our obligation is different. We are not only doing it for Jesus, but we are doing it as an exercise in following Jesus. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus approach the problems of the world? How did Jesus approach the struggles that face communities? How did Jesus treat people? And we don't want to just do whatever we want to do in the name of Jesus, but we want to follow Jesus in doing things like he did things. And so those are the three principles we're going to be talking about up front. These are fundamental. They're going to kind of give a shape to this difference that I'm talking about that is going to start to transform the way we think about politics into something other than left and right, Republican and Democrat, etc., etc., etc. And so the first one we want to talk about for just the few minutes we have left today, I want to kind of lay it on the ground, is that Jesus was inescapably political. Now, we're not used to this because we're used to politics being going to vote on election day and running for office yourself and and letting your voice be heard through petitions and through writing letters to your senators and your representatives we're used to politics being this game this dance between different parties who are vying for power so they can control things but uh, one of the things that we have to understand is that really at the end of the day is just one manifestation of politics American politics, as we understand it, whether we think it's healthy or unhealthy, is just one way of doing politics. And to talk about politics ultimately is a broader conversation that um, really just refers to the way that we organize communities. The way that societies organize themselves, the way that we treat one another as neighbors. And so at a very basic level to say that Jesus is inescapably political is to recognize that, for instance, um, Jesus gives us the greatest commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind, your, your um, strength. He says this is the first and the greatest commandment. Second, like unto it is you shall love your neighbor as yourself upon these two hang the whole of the law and the prophets. Those are political statements they have a bearing on how we form communities, on how we treat one another, on how we do business as a group of people. And so Jesus is at the very heart of that, and as it plays out, he is talking about something that is political. Not necessarily American political. He's not talking about voting or parties or Republicans or Democrats or socialism or capitalism or, or any of those things that we normally associate with being political, but he's saying this is how we should live as a society. He is offering a politic. What's more, Jesus is inescapably political in every aspect of his life. If you sit back and you think about it, the terms that we apply to Jesus, the terms that Jesus applied to himself, the things that we see claimed about him in scripture are almost entirely, inherently political. And so, for instance, in Matthew chapter 3, at his baptism, when he goes down into the water with John the Baptist, he's baptized, he comes out of the water, that dove comes down on him, uh, or the spirit, rather, comes down on him in the form of a dove from heaven, and the voice from heaven proclaims, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All of that happened in a world where what was going on was not explicitly religious. We like to make that spiritual language, you know, church language, religion language, but all of it in his world would have been interpreted as a primary political sort of thing. To call someone in his day or time, particularly in that Jewish culture, a son of God, 
was to make a political claim. This is the king. This is a royal one that has been chosen by God. To be anointed by the Spirit, which is the imagery being portrayed with the, the Spirit in the form of a dove coming down on Jesus, the anointing is the sort of thing that you would do to a king. Kings were anointed, and so with the anointing of the Spirit and the proclamation, this is my Son, the Son of God, um, the New Testament establishes Jesus as a political character. He is a king. In the next chapter, in Matthew chapter 4, the temptations, which we'll probably come back and talk to or talk about a little bit more later. Uh, when he goes out into the wilderness, he's tempted by the tempter. The tempter frames the temptations, if you are the Son of God, if you are the King. That is, the temptations are at their heart, not personal temptations, as if there would be some sin if Jesus were uh, hungry and decided to eat. Um, but they were temptations about his reign, his politic as a king. What sort of king are you going to be? And then later in Matthew chapter 4, after the temptations, down around verses 16 and 17, when he comes back into um, when he comes back into uh, Galilee and he begins his ministry, right? Matthew there summarizes the message that Jesus is bringing and the, the, the summary of Jesus' message that he brought was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And of course that ties into a long line of Old Testament texts talking about the time when God would against the broken and inept and corrupt and evil kings of the world who have made such a mess of things, God would come and he would establish himself as king and he would begin to set right all of the things that we've gotten wrong. He would introduce an alternative political reality, a kingdom. And so to say that Jesus is a king and the tempter was asking him what sort of king are you going to be what sort of politic are you going to uphold to say that he was bringing the kingdom of God king and kingdom these are political realities and they would have been understood as such in his day he would have been understood as um, as being in direct opposition with Herod who certainly saw Jesus as a political threat with of Caesar and Pilate who also saw Jesus as a political threat. Um, when uh, Pilate crucified Jesus, he puts on the cross, that plaque that said in multiple languages, here is the king of the Jews. And of course the Jews protested against that, but the whole subtext there is that what you did is you crucified political dissidents, those who uh, posed a threat to the order and the authority and the sanctity of Rome. That's what crucifixion was for. And so Pilate gives a nod to what he understood Jesus to be. Here is the king of the Jews, and you know what we do with people who suppose to be king. We crucify them. And in Acts chapter 2, we learn as the crowd responds to Peter's message having the Spirit poured out on him uh, where their mind was at. The problem they had at the time was that when Peter at the end of his sermon in Acts chapter 2 and those verses leading up to verse 28, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, the verse we know, um, in the verses leading up to that, he declares Jesus as Christ and Lord. This Jesus whom you have crucified, God has now declared as Christ and Lord. And that was political language. Particularly that term, Lord. Jesus was born into, he lived in, he was crucified in, he was resurrected in a world where there was already a Lord. They already had someone they called Lord, and that was Caesar. And you'll remember that the crowd that was gathered around Pentecost, at least some of them were at the crowd gathered around Pilate's court at the time, um, or at the time that he pronounced the, the sentence on Jesus some months later. And uh, they, when Pilate said, here is your king, they said, we have no king but Caesar. And so in Acts chapter 2, when Peter says, this one that you crucified, and you can hear the echoes. We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. 
This one that you crucified, God has declared him the Lord. Not Caesar. Him. That was the crux of the problem for them. They realized in that moment that they backed the wrong king. And so all I want to say today, all I want to get at today, is that Jesus is inescapably political. You can't talk about Jesus without talking about politics. And there are lots of other instances that we could talk about. I'll, I'll try to post some of those on the Facebook page in written form as we go through this week. I just don't want to go on too far this morning. But Jesus was a king with a kingdom. And when he started talking about that kingdom, what he presented the people as an alternative to Caesar and Herod and the way that Rome did things and the way the world did things, what he offered them was a politic, a way of being together, of being community, of being a group of people that was different than the way the rest of the world did business. Now, we haven't said anything as of yet about what shape that politic takes, about what kind of king Jesus was, or what it means to follow him as king, to obey him as king. We, we haven't got to any of that yet. That's number two. Remember, number one was today. Jesus was inescapably political. There is no way that you can look at what we see about Jesus in the New Testament and see him as anything but a political figure in his world and his enemies and his followers both understood him as such. Number two, which is what we will take up next week, but he was political in ways that were radically different than everybody else around him. And so what we're aiming for here is a way of talking about and embodying being a community of being together, of ordering our lives as a group that's as political, that is radically different than the way the rest of the world is doing it. And in doing that, we bear witness to the good news of Jesus. And so I'm eager to next week start talking about what the shape of that difference is is so that we can be light in the midst of this darkness. That's ultimately what we're trying to do here. To follow Jesus who is the light into the darkness and bear witness to him. Alright, so I've got a dog barking. We're going to wrap it up. Um, let's pray. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me here in just a minute. Then we'll remember who we are as we go into God's world. Father, we pray that you would shape us and that you would mold us, that we would be your people, that we would have as our core identity that of Christ, and that we would not cede that ground to anyone else. Teach us what it means to follow him. And now we come to you and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, have a great week. We'll see you next time. Love y'all.